Good evening and welcome all to the Civility Project. My name is Lynn Brown. I'm executive director of the Bradamus Center, which is delighted to be able to bring you this conversation this evening. I will have a very brief promise introduction just to set the event in context and then get out of the way. This is the first in a series of what we hope will be an important, enlightening, and even entertaining exploration on the topic of civility. To my mind, civility is one of those Warshak test kind of concepts. The word conjures up different patterns and meanings depending on one's viewpoint and perspective and experiences. The exercise we embark on this evening is not meant to pin that concept down, but rather to let it roam and over different perspectives and different disciplines from philosophy and history to politics and psychology to religion and art. And to have that roaming take place under the guidance of some of our leading thinkers and scholars and writers and activists. The Bradamus Center has taken on this uh, project because of its mission and the legacy of our founder, John Bradamus, uh, who was a member of the US Congress for over 20 years and then president of NYU for over a decade. In Washington, DC, John was a fierce partisan, but he deeply, deeply devoted to the legislative process and to the, and to the belief that reason discourse could be had across a wide political spectrum. And at Washington Square, he thought the role of a university, among other things, was to provide space for reflection and debate. And so we get to it. Tonight, we begin this series with what we think should be a first step, and that is what we call interrogating civility. Asking a set of questions, the answers to which should not be assumed or taken for granted. Is civility always an unalloyed good? Throughout the past and into the present, who has gotten to define civility and to what end? And what are the limits of civility in advancing other worthy, go other worthy goals, such as domestic, domestic tranquility, the search for uh, pursuit of equality, the search for justice? We have a luminous gathering to take us on this journey and in the role of moderator, a very sure-footed guide, Professor Uli Baer, Director of the Center of Humanities at NYU. His interests and inquiries cover a wide span, literature, photography, poetry, translation, even a dystopian novel. And he has not been reluctant to provoke debate in his own interrogations most recently in questioning the limits of free speech in the 21st century university. So to Professor Baer, who will introduce our panelists and get the conversation going. To you, Uli. Uh, thank you so much, Lynn. So it's really a, a pleasure and thank you, Lynn, as a longtime colleague to be invited by the Bradamas Center. I wanna acknowledge the Bradamas Center, first of all, for initiating this conversation among scholars, some of whom are working in the same university, but don't have enough occasion to actually talk with each other. And I want to acknowledge the organizers of this conference at the Bradema Center to conduct this conversation in the spirit um, of uh, engaged deep conversation that doesn't take anybody's viewpoints for granted. I want to thank my colleagues uh, who are here today and I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak, which is alphabetical. And it's really a pleasure and an honor to have all four of you here to uh, weigh in on this important topic. Um, the first speaker will be Professor Kwame Anthony Apia, who is Professor of Law and Philosophy at New York University. You can also find their bios in the chat, <clears throat> but I want to acknowledge that he is a widely read and known um, so-called public intellectual in the best sense of the word. He's the author of several groundbreaking books, including Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, which I regularly teach to a freshman seminar at NYU, also Experiments in Ethics, and most recently, The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity. 
Professor Appiah also publishes every Sunday a column in the New York Times Magazine called The Ethicist. So if you want to see him weigh in on both mundane and uh, topics of enormous gravity, please check out his column in the New York Times. The second speaker will be Professor Jonathan Haidt, who is the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at NYU's uh, Stern School of Business. Professor Haidt is a social psychologist, but his work, like all the speakers today, goes far beyond the discipline in which he was originally appointed or trained. He has co-founded a variety of organizations and collaborations, including Heterodox Academy, Open Mind Platform, and Ethical Systems, and those can be found on the web, and they are platforms and actually interventions to create the possibility of dialogue for people to speak across disciplines who may not agree on anything, but perhaps agree on the value of being in conversation. He's the author of The Happiness Hypothesis, Finding Modern Truth in Ancient Wisdom, and the New York Times bestsellers, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion, and with Greg Lukianov, The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. The next speaker will be Professor Lynn Hidagaki, who is an award-winning educator and writer who speaks about interracial relations. And Lynn, it's really a pleasure to have you on the panel because you're the one person who's not at NYU regularly, but we hope to see a lot of you in the future. Lynn, uh, study is uh, appointed in English and Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Missouri and has been nationally recognized as an expert on interracial civility and conflict, who has been featured regularly in the media. She's the author of the book Civil Racism, the 1992 Los Angeles Rebellion and the Crisis of Racial Burnout, which examines the post-civil rights era in terms of that LA conflict. The speaker who will follow Lynn is my colleague, Professor Catherine Stimson, who is Dean Emerita of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at New York University and a university professor. She's founding editor of the journal Science, Journal of Women and Culture and Society, which I access with such regularity, Kate, that I actually think I'm constantly in conversation with you, which has really changed the scholarship around literature, philosophy, and culture for several decades now. She's also been the uh, director of the fellows program at the MacArthur Foundation and the president of the Modern Language Association. She's published widely and enormously on topics as far ranging as J.R.R. Tolkien. And you know that I read your first book on that to Gertrude Stein and major works on the role of gender studies and the category of gender and analyzing culture and literature. So I want to thank the speakers, and I will step out of the way quite quickly. We have a bit of an echo here. I'm, uh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, let me try this again. It, it seems to be lighting up Ellen Toscano's screen. Perhaps Ellen can mute. Yes, maybe this is. Um, uh, I think Ellen was on twice. Um, so. Uh, all four scholars will make some remarks and then we'll hope to have a conversation, as all of you know, and I want to thank the audience for participating right now. You can put your questions or comments in the Q&A and I will moderate as best as I can. As Lynn said, we're here to investigate and examine the concept of civility, which is such a vital ingredient to living together as people of different opinions who hope for different outcomes. And like civility, other concepts in recent years have been examined, I think, quite robustly and productively as having the promise to elevate us and let us aspire to our better selves, such as free speech or academic freedom or even democracy or identity or diversity. But we've also seen sometimes in pretty graphic detail that some of these concepts can be used for other ends that actually rather than encouraging the best practice for all of us to live together, they can be means to silence others, to exclude others. That the exhortation to be civil can be used by those in power to keep all of those who don't agree how power has been distributed quiet, in line, to obey, to basically not speak. 
So civility, like these concepts, must be interrogated rather than ritualistically or mindlessly invoked. It does not serve to say civility is an inherent good. And here in closing, I would like to refer to another former professor and faculty member at New York University, the novelist Ralph Waldo Ellison, who is the, uh, the author, of course, of Invisible Man, one of the path-breaking novels of the 20th century, and then the posthumously published novel Juneteenth, which Ellison didn't finish. And Ellison had a very important concept in mind that I think goes to the heart of what we're trying to understand today. Ellison wrote of the idea of antagonistic cooperation, which means that people who disagree on just about everything have nonetheless commit to cooperate in their antagonism. But what Ellison adds to this, that people who disagree will have to cooperate, is that the goal for which they cooperate together, what we could call the common good or living together peacefully, that goal must be continually redefined. I think the reason why Ellison, one of the reasons, never finished Juneteenth, his second novel, which was ultimately published under the, under the editorial leadership of John Callahan, is because Ellison couldn't quite work out how to conceive of the common good if the notion of commonality and the good remains that which is defined by those in power. So if we think of civility as a means to getting to a better place, I think it's important to think of civility as that which can also be wielded against those who criticize that only some people get to define what's good and others have to live in that order. So I will step out of the way. And uh, again, I wanna thank the panelists for being here. I wanna thank the Bradama Center for organizing this. And I wanna thank all of the people in attendance today uh, to pay attention to this. And I'll invite Professor Appiah to start. Um, you'll all uh, contribute some and then hopefully we'll get to a conversation. Um, thank you again. And I will be back uh, when you have uh, contributed your pieces. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Ali. And thanks to all for uh, inviting me and for organizing this. Uh, because civility has its root in a Latin word for citizen, it's natural to think it's a disposition to treat other citizens as we should. Uh, if you take the Greek word for citizen, polites, as your root instead, you get polite. And one job of civility is to refer to a baseline of good manners between citizens. Manners are important. Unless they've wronged us, strangers deserve to be treated with respect. That, I think, is part of basic morality. But more than manners are at stake. In a democracy, we are each equally charged with piloting the ship of state together. When we relate as fellow citizens, we should treat each other respectfully, not as a matter of manners, but because we actually regard each other with genuine respect. John Rawls started from our sense of justice that guides each to offer fair terms of cooperation uh, to the others, and our conception of the good, our ideas about what it is for human life to go well. And that sense of justice is central precisely because we have different conceptions of the good. And that sets the challenge for finding fair terms of cooperation. If we all agreed on what was the best life, a life of Christian service, a life of submission to Allah, an Epicurean philosophy of carpe diem, we could converge on a society that enabled such a life. But Rawls recognized that a modern society must proceed without any such agreement. North Atlantic liberals came to that understanding after the disastrous uh, European wars of religion after the Reformation. It turned out you couldn't convert people at the point of the sword, and the practical reality that you couldn't enforce agreement came to be accompanied by an ethical idea that people were entitled to live by their own ideals. Now, these ideas will fail to impress many of our fellow citizens today, especially if we tell them that these are the core ideas of liberalism since many people seem to think that liberalism is precisely what they abhor. But unless they're ready to contemplate politics of expulsion and extermination, they are bound, if they're reasonable, to agree that we need to figure out how to live together with our different ideas about how to live well. They're bound to have to consider Rawls's question about what makes the fair terms of cooperation. And once they see that that question, they must accept again, if they're reasonable, that we have to be able to discuss these issues despite our differences 
and that our conversations will lead nowhere if they are always angry and discourteous. Civility as politeness arises naturally, I think, within this liberal vision, but it's just a piece of practical good sense. I don't mean we can never raise our voices. Sometimes when someone has wronged you, indignation is appropriate and you should raise your voice. Outrage, outrage sometimes communicates better the strength of a conviction or the depth of a wrong. But we cannot shout all the time and we won't find routes to cooperation and to compromise if we never lower our voices. So sometimes to insist on the point, civility does require politeness. But once more, courtesy cannot be enough. We have problems to solve together. We need a form of civility, a disposition towards each other as fellow citizens that seeks for practical compromises rather than ideological triumph. I must be willing to accept solutions that don't seem to me the best when they make it easier for others of my fellow citizens to accept them too. One thing civility requires beyond politeness is a willingness to compromise. And our current ideological tribalism is making that impossible. What is to be done? Well, long ago, Gordon Allport argued that contact between individuals of different identities makes hostility less likely if it occurs within frameworks that meet certain conditions. Crucially, it needs to be on terms of rough equality and in activities where shared goals are pursued in ways that demand reliance on one another. America's racially integrated armed services, for example, produce people who are less racist on average when they arrive, uh, when they leave than when they arrive. That's because they have contact on terms of rough equality in activities where they have to rely upon one another. But our political tribes are increasingly segregated. So we need to find more spaces where people of our dominant political tribes build the social trust that allows tribes to cohabit. We need to be in conversation with one another across our differences. I want to give you just in closing a story uh, uh, that exemplifies how that works. It's an episode from the TV series Skins, which is about a high school student set in England. And uh, there's a birthday party for Anwar, who's a Muslim uh, English teenager of South Asian Muslim ancestry, and his father is a devout Muslim. And Anwar's best friend, uh, Maxi, is gay and, and white. And he's been waiting for Anwar, Maxi has, to tell his parents uh, that he's gay, which Anwar has been um, scared to do because he's worried that his Muslim parents will mean that, that can't, they can't be friends. So Maxi's standing outside refu refusing to come into the party until Anwar finally uh, tells them. Now, while the boys are talking, Anwar's father comes out and he and Maxi are in discussion. And Anwar finally says, seeing this is not going anywhere, uh, dad, Maxi's gay and his father ignores him. So then Maxi himself says, I'm gay, Mr. Corral. I always have been. And there's this long silence. And then Mr. Corral says this, it's a stupid messed up world. I've got my God. He speaks to me every day. Some things I just can't work out. So I leave them be okay, even if I think they're wrong because I know one day he'll make me understand. I've got that trust. It's called belief. I'm a lucky man, right? Come Maxi, the food is ready. This is how things are with people who are in conversation with one another. Mr. Corral belongs to the Muslim tribe and Maxi's tribe is Christian or perhaps post-Christian, but they don't need to agree. They just have to accept each other. And they can do that without sharing principles because they're being together, the being together of this man who's known his son all these years, who's come to their dinner table, has generated commitments that can transcend even serious disagreement. Mr. Corral begins in exactly the right place. The world is hard to understand. He may not be right about everything. He doesn't forsake his belief that homosexuality is wrong. He just puts it aside as something to work out later. Right now, what matters is celebrating his son's 17th birthday with his son's best friend. This works in practice. It doesn't need a theory. I'm a philosopher. I like theories. But if we are to treat each other properly as fellow citizens, theory, propositions, principles are not the only things that matter. I'm mute. Jonathan, you still unmute. Okay. All right. Alphabetically, I'm next. So um, here we go. It's a pleasure to uh, to speak after Anthony Appy in particular. Um, Anthony's books uh, have long been wrestling with this question of 
how do we live together in diverse societies without killing each other? Uh, and I was especially moved. I, I spent a year at Princeton and learned a lot from him in 2007. Um, his book, Cosmopolitan, uh, the, one of the basic lessons I remember is the goal isn't to reach agreement, it's just to find a way to get used to each other. Uh, and Anthony has been wrestling with this for a long time and he traces out the origin of liberal institutions, which he began to do in his eight minute talk. So I'd like to pick up from that point. I'd like to talk about the rise and fall of liberal institutions and liberal societies. Um, this story will make clear why it is that we must have a certain kind of civility. And here I don't mean politeness and decorum. Um, I wanna focus on the institutions that make liberal societies excellent and open and tolerant and prosperous and innovative and wonderful. And I'd like to talk about a kind of incivility that has exploded since 2012. And that is especially intimidation, ad hominem arguments. There's a kind of a nastiness um, that isn't just yelling. It's actually trying to harm people who say certain things, which shuts them up. And when we do that, we get stupid, our institutions get stupid and liberal societies go down. So um, uh, I guess a version of the story is told, especially in Jonathan Rausch. Uh, Jonathan Rausch has this brilliant recent book called The Constitution of Knowledge. And the book is a bit of a, the title is a bit of a pun or a play on words in that, um, you know, what, the, what makes up knowledge, what constitutes knowledge, but he means it literally as the US constitution or the, Const like the constitution of knowledge. And he says that he traces out how the founding fathers were very good psychologists. They understood the, the way that democracies are prone to passions. They understood the way that people are prone to confirmation bias. We believe what we wanna believe. We're not very reasonable or rational as individuals and their genius, Madison's genius, was to create institutions that pit different people with different confirmation biases against each other, that pit different factions against each other and that forced them <clears throat> Uh, put them in a kind of a managed conflict that forces them to reach some kind of agreement. And the magic is that out of flawed people contesting, actually truth and wisdom and justice can come. And Rausch traces out how we see the same process, uh, not just in the US constitution, which gave us legislatures, um, but he talks about the other, the epistemic operating system of a liberal society. What is it that gives us truth? What is it that we use to find truth better than any individual could? And he talks about courts. We have an adversarial court system, which does the same thing in front of an impartial jury. And we have universities that put scholars into contention. Scientists don't, um, scientists don't try to disconfirm their own ideas. Uh, you know, you hear this ideal talk, oh, a scientist is more interested in finding out why he's wrong. No, scientists want right. We really want to be right. Um, and we're ego invested in our theories. But what's amazing and wonderful about being in a university is that you're embedded in all these systems in where you don't have to do the disconfirmation. Guaranteed other people, especially hungry young people who wanna prove a senior professor wrong are motivated to do so. And so universities are these brilliant institutions that take flawed individuals and into managed contest, contestation and out of that truth flows. Journalism, same story. Journalism used to be terrible. You know, the invention of the printing press led to all kinds of horrible nastiness. Um, it wasn't until you get the field of journalism and you get norms that create, again, managed conflict between sources, you get fact checking, you get editors. So all of this is sort of the rise of liberalism reaching a high point in the mid to late 20th century where we really do have excellent epistemic institutions. Now, of course, every there are problems in everything all the time, but um, we, uh, we create a society that is prosperous, that is making rapid progress in sciences, social sciences, making rapid progress in civil rights. Uh, we get an increasingly liberal society. Uh, the story that I'd like to tell that I'm trying to write up in, in, a, in a book right now called Life After Babel is that, you know, the Tower of Babel story, God confounds our language, we can't understand each other. But thousands, after thousands of years, we reach a high point in the early 2000s, I'd say actually 2011, I'd say is kind of the high point. Um, in which we actually do begin to be able to understand each other. Actually, Google Translate actually allows us to literally talk across languages. Um, but that's where things begin to go downhill. Something went really wrong in the 2010s. And I would say it's because of the rise of a certain kind of intimidation. 
the kind of intimidation that was made easy, it was democratized, it was made cheap and free by Twitter in particular, uh, but all of the platforms that use this the uh, viral algorithmically driven uh, um, <clears throat> uh, mechanisms. Um, so the, if you can put yourself back in the early days of Facebook and Twitter, they were actually pretty nice places. They were not about destroying people, they were about sharing. And uh, if you go back to around 2008, 2010, there was a widespread idea that social media was going to be the greatest gift to democracies ever. What dictator could keep out the internet? And then we had the Arab Spring. Oh my God, you know, social media is gonna be God's gift to open societies, liberal societies. Um, there was a period of techno-democratic optimism, but everything began to go downhill in 2009 when uh, Facebook added the like button, Twitter added the retweet button. Uh, now they have a lot more information from users and now they can algorithmize the feeds and what they prioritize for is anger, emotion, but especially anger. So, so now our news feeds are flooded with uh, posts expressing anger and people are rewarded for this kind of aggressive, nasty incivility. They're rewarded for ad hominem attacks. Um, the net effect of having lots of people on you is intimidation. And so the, when, uh, when Twitter added the retweet button, an engineer who worked on it said many years later, he said he really regretted his participation because he said he watched the Twitter mobs forming. He said, it's as if we just handed a loaded gun to a four-year-old. And that's the world we've lived in ever since, a world where everyone can intimidate anyone, uh, where we have sort of decentralized intimidation um, and people are now walking on eggshells. So to bring this home to what we're talking about here, uh, I think Uli at, raised the question whether civility is always and everywhere an unalloyed good. Uh, no, that's a good question. I would completely agree. No, it is not. There are times when violence is appropriate even. Um, there, I don't think that's ever appropriate in, within a university or a legislature or, or, or a newspaper. Um, but um, what I want to focus us on is institutions that have a key role in our society. Jonathan Rauch's epistemic institutions. And I would, wanna, I would like to put out there uh, that social media in particular, and Twitter and Instagram, but especially Twitter, um, has, has led to an explosive growth of, of nastiness, intimidation, mob dynamics that have systematically uh, made people afraid to express contrary opinions. And when you shut your critics up, when you, in, when you intimidate your critics, it makes you stupider. We rely on other people to disconfirm our beliefs. That's, what's the, that's what these institutions do. They put us into managed conflict. And I have watched in horror since 2015, as many institutions, beginning with universities, became structurally stupid because they allowed in a kind of a, a decentralized intimidation. Um, and um, let's see. Um, so, um, so I think I'm sure we will hear arguments that civility is uh, is used to keep people down, that civility is overrated, that incivility is necessary, uh, and I would agree that there are times that it is. But I would just like to make the case that if we don't talk about society or in general, but look institution by institution, I think we will see that in our major institutions um, there is no role for incivility because. It makes the institution go haywire. It makes it fail in its basic purpose. And what we're seeing now is the massive loss of trust in our major institutions, certainly journalism, universities, the medical establishment, um, the scientific uh, community. We're seeing a massive loss of trust, um, which I believe could be fatal to a liberal society such as ours that rests on, as Rauch says, this constitution of knowledge. So I will stop there. Thank you, Jonathan and Lynn, uh, uh, you are up next. Thank you. Well, thank you. Additional thank yous to the organizers, Michael, Lynn, Ellen, Tom, Nessa, and Uli for this opportunity to interrogate civility and to all of you for making time to come tonight. I am hosted in this virtual space by a university that is now on the occupied, unceded, and seized territory of the Chickasaw, Oto, Missouri, Osage, and Quapaw peoples. I thank them for their past and continued stewardship of the land. I begin with indigenous peoples of what is now the state of Missouri because our interracial history is a continuing struggle over what is considered legitimate political discourse. 
to talk about the phrase that is dominating the headlines today. Legitimate political discourse has and continues to encompass the past and present exclusion of indigenous black and people of color. So I uh, will be one of those people who talk about civility in very measured ways that we have a role for civility, but with a lot of self-reflexivity, a lot of deep reflection and a lot of accountability. And I'm concerned with the way, as Professor Apia talks about, that um, the new understanding of politics, as um, Professor Haight has, has talked about, that it breaks down potential new commitments to each other. So civility is then a paradox for people and communities who have been excluded from full citizenship, accorded less importance in public debates, if not silenced completely, or treated as lesser citizens and indeed lesser humanity. We as a nation struggle with what is civil and uncivil given this history of violence. And we can start with incivility and the imprecision of the term. Is it democide? The killing of one's political opponents or the intimidation as, as we just heard, right? Or yelling in anger, frustration or name calling. So thus civility is usually forced to counter this wide range of behaviors in the hopes that exhortations to civil behavior will stem escalations to violence. However, what is much less recognized is the violence is held within civility, that certain kinds of violences by certain kinds of people are considered civil or even civility producing, whether that's criminal punishment, incarceration, border patrols, attacks on foreign and domestic enemies. And yet civility still has such purchase in society. Administrators, managers, and leaders of organizations repeatedly expend time, energy, and resources on establishing civility codes to manage what they determine to be unproductive ways of dealing with conflicts. And then much time, energy, and resources are often expended on the ways of dealing with conflicts, oftentimes at the expense of addressing the conflict itself. Instead of other concepts that are often used to describe civility, such as mutual respect, accountability, cooperation, responsibility, we return to civility likely because of its deeply rooted connection to citizenship, what citizens owe to each other, what citizens owe to the state, or perhaps more accurately, which behaviors citizens owe to each other and which behaviors citizens owe to the state. So the question I come to is every demand for a return to civility, a desire to return to a previously imagined status quo. Largely, yes. There are other ways of getting at the purported goals of civility, mutual respect, turn-taking, accountability, individual and social responsibility. But we return again and again to civility as the ostensibly impartial arbiter concept, despite its long history of quelling long suppressed voices, ideas, and experiences. So a common strategy in moderating conflict is to delay, distract, and thwart addressing the issue at hand, oftentimes racial and gender equality in representation. We instead might invest our efforts in civility. So when there is conflict, we devolt to the previous status quo to erase conflicts, even though those conditions were what gave rise to the conflicts themselves. Or we imagine a previously harmonious time of peace and civility when that peace and civility rested on the active and passive exclusion and silencing of dissent. Demands for civility are usually top down, something extracted from those below, those who are managed, administered, or led. Those toward the bottom usually demand equality, dignity, and humanity rather than civility. So civility efforts are a way of managing the incivilities resulting from a conflict too long submerged or misidentified as the peaceful status quo. Take for example, international organizations, which say international in their names, but center global north priorities or research. Or other institutions that demand diversity labor and representation from its members or workers, not for career building spotlights, but for their racial and gendered experiences that check diversity and equity boxes. Elected leadership and representatives in particular have a unique role in these demands for civility an often employed strategy is leadership encourages people with different and dissenting ideas to ask or stand election for a seat at the table. Essentially, you are told if you do not abide by the codes of civility, usually interpreted to mean politeness or dutifully following procedures, then you don't get a seat at the table. 
or more insidiously, you don't get to ask for a seat. You won't be considered worthy for a seat. And I think about Professor Caritha Mitchell's Know Your Place Racism here. In this case, get in line, fill out a form and patiently wait for your name to be called or for conditions to equalize. Which begs the question of who are these current leaders and elected representatives actually representing? In this outsourcing of responsibility and addressing the issue at hand, this strategy buttresses the previous status quo that excluded this dissent rather than representing the membership in its full range that would include its criticism of existing unjust organizational practices and outcomes. So if we were to analyze, for example, and I'm taking this as just one, two public facing conversations that the American Psychological Association had in recent years together, the association's efforts to relate the groundwork for civility in their professional organization published um, under an article titled, Making the APA Civil Again, in light of the more official recent apologies from the APA for its role in perpetuating institution, institutional racism, but which neglected to include um, conversations with the Association for Black Psychologists and other ethnic minority organizations, as well as its, the APA's adverse global impact on mental health. So the times of the APA's previous civility dovetail with its perpetuation of systemic racism. And this is just one prominent recent example. If the APA, other professional organizations or US mainstream politics were ever civil in the past that we are encouraged to return to, making APA civil again, or perhaps making America civil again, then in that idyllically civil past, who and what injustices are ignored or were ignored, silenced or excluded for civility to reign? So in this discussion, I'm emphasizing the agency in institutional leaders to demand civility, but I'm also exhorting a marshalling of whatever collective accountability those less powerful members, workers, participants, voters might have, as well as those who think they are, on the by, they are the bystanders to the conflict and the public of public opinion to continue to scrutinize these delay and distract strategies that often return us to the past status quo of a historically elite concept of citizenship and the have nots who are forced to prove daily in every interaction that they are civil beings worthy of equality, humanity, dignity. So we should be deeply suspicious with demands for civility that are often deployed to quell dissents from marginalized populations and that dampen democratic futures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. And, uh, and next we have uh, uh, Kate Simpson. So Kate, if you can go. You. Kate, you're muted. I know, Kate, now I'm you're... unmuted. <laughs> Great. Yeah, uh, like everyone, I want to thank the Bradhamus Center for bringing us together. I want to thank the audience for being here. And I may talk very quickly to leave time for all of us to talk together. And I want to thank my fellow panelists and Uli, you too. It's always good to see you and hear you. I agree with some things that all of my fellow panelists have said. So I'm not here to build a false consensus. I'm here to say in this rich array of ideas, there's much that I find quite wonderful. Now, why do people praise civility? And why do people praise people who are civil? civil? Unfortunately, as an ideal and social practice, civility carries a lot of baggage. And Professor Idigaki has listed some of that baggage for me. So Lynn, thank you for doing that work for me. But despite the heavy baggage, our society needs civility in order to sustain itself. Why is this so? It is so simply because nearly all of us are as capable of dealing out pain as we are of bestowing love in our private or public lives. Homo sapiens has been cruelly intelligent in building its vast portfolios of the ways of administering both physical and psychological suffering. The internet is yes, but our latest construction. We can starve people or deprive them of psychological sustenance 
or inflict bullying, beatings, batterings, and torture, or do all of these horrors at once. And being powerful seems not to guarantee being benign. On the contrary, and I think all my fellow panelists would agree, being powerful gives permission to do harm. So I would say to all of us, one of our most desperately serious of questions is how can we reduce, mitigate, remediate, or police harm? One answer focuses on governments. They can have laws that criminalize war. In American law, courts can convict someone for causing pain and suffering. But even good, however, even if good enough governments are necessary, they are not sufficient. And this is so for at least two reasons. First, governments themselves can do harm, even good enough democratic governments. And next, even with some laws in the books, psychological harms can be hidden, invisible and inaudible to all but the closest of observers. Painfully, this occurs with rape victims. The need to veil pain is one feature of the sadism in our historical portfolios of suffering. But let us hopefully assume that civility can read its, uh, rid itself of its historical baggage. Let us further, as hopefully, assume that civility can be inclusive rather than exclusive. And if these assumptions can become a part of everyday life, civility can play a crucial political and social role. In active parallel processing with the law, civility can offer a set of norms for political and social relations that reject the infliction of suffering. And if enough people behave like this, and I hope my fellow panelists do not consider me hopelessly utopian, if enough people behave like this, more caring and lively communities will emerge. But now, in a couple of minutes, let us imagine what the substance of a new set of norms might be. Let me offer an example of such a new set. I call it the new decorum. Now the old decorum, and Lynn, you were really good on this. The old decorum carries with it some of the same baggage as the concept of civility. And in addition, in culture after culture, women are to ally decorous codes of behavior with subordination to the men of their class. Nevertheless, let me sketch the new decorum. It has three imperatives. And this is almost a synonym for civility. First, scrape away and dump the historical baggage of the old decorum. Second, stop inflicting unwarranted suffering. Follow the injunction, do no harm. And the third imperative, and here I'm echoing my fellow panelists. The third imperative is a deep consideration of others for their selfhood and bodily autonomy. And this necessarily demands some personal restraint. The I must often check its needs in the presence of the other. For example, the need to fondle or kiss a subordinate or make a really stupid misogynistic crack on Twitter or elsewhere. So these three imperatives of the new decorum, get rid of the baggage of the old, do no harm, deeply consider others, would spring into action in many situations. One is the life of trans children and people. Our norms would prohibit sneers, insults, the denial of appropriate medical procedure, and violence against trans children and people. 
our norms of the new decorum or the new civility would respect their claiming of their own sexual and gender identity. Yeah, for heaven's sake, let the child mindfully use the darned bathroom of his, her, their choice. Now, a reality of the new decorum is that the giving and earning of respect is hard, endless work. For it demands recognizing the human capacity for inflicting harm, as well as the vast range of differences among us and the power relations they inevitably embody. The new decorum, or my version of civility I am offering tonight, is not a recipe for mealy mouth speech. You're right, Jonathan, in your books. Mealy mouth speech makes us stupid. On the contrary, it celebrates freedom of speech, thought, and of the arts. The new decorum is not an etiquette lesson in sweet insincerities. On the contrary, it admires the sincerity that refuses the temptations of meanness and malice. The new decorum is not a demand for the repression of righteous anger. On the contrary, the powerful must behave as well as the less powerful do and give up power they exercise painfully. So a reconstituted civility or my new decorum would be messy. It might bring its own pain if the powerful do what the powerful so often do, cling to their balconies and guns. The new decorum or the new civility would demand good sense, amiability, a grasp of truth, a dollop of kindness, and a dose of courage would help. So shall we begin? All right, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, to our panelists, and if I may, um, maybe I can um, try to capture something uh, between Lynn and Jonathan. I think it would be worthwhile or useful to see. There seems to be a slightly different diagnosis of the present, and in some ways, Jonathan painted a picture of liberal institutions going into decline. And then until the mid 19th, 20th century, there were excellent liberal institutions, but something has happened partly through the invention by our NYU non-graduate Jack Dorsey who invented Twitter. And Lynn actually painted a different picture and said perhaps any return to any idea that something was good once uh, glosses over the fact that that good actually happened at the exclusion of many, many people who now have gained access and a voice. Anthony and Kate, uh, Kate actually proposed a kind of governance or what Anthony called framework and a kind of way out. But maybe if Lynn and Jonathan in the little time we have could sort of say, it sounded to me there was a slightly different analysis of the situation we are in. And one, if I can capture that, and I know I'm not doing justice to the fullness of your arguments, but Jonathan said something, there was something worthwhile and that has begun a decline. And Lynn was perhaps saying that what, have, what we had before wasn't quite as good as it may look because so many people weren't part of that good. So maybe Jonathan and Lynn, if you could start and then uh, Anthony and Kate, you kind of had the way out, the framework governance structure with these kind of mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, um, all right, I'll, I'll go first then um, and just say that I'm not saying we need to go back to some previous time in, in all respects, uh, but I think there are certain features of institutional life that are essential for its functioning. One of those in the academy is curiosity and, and humor and uh, pleasure in exploring ideas. And, and there was that, and I do think we should return to that. I don't think we can do our work when there is much more fear. Uh, students are afraid of each other. Professors are afraid of each other. Um, one slip, one word, um, can lead to a whole big thing on Twitter, which then leads to an investigation. So the phrase walking on eggshells 
Um, so I, I don't, you know, I think Lynn and I could have a productive discussion about protest movements. That would be one thing. What what do we think about protest movements? You know, should they be civil? Should they be uncivil? And there's empirical questions about what kind of protest movement work. And then I think it's a different discussion. What should the norms be in a university, a place like Yale or NYU? Are these places where we need a lot more incivility and aggressive protest, or are these places where, where if if one group feels excluded, they would make their case it within a civil way? I, I, so that's the way I see it. But Lynn, maybe you see it. You're probably seeing it in an orthogonal, some way, some different way. I definitely agree with you that there are features so similar to Professor Stimson that there are features that can be reclaimed. I think what I see is more that um, intimidation that was largely directed toward marginalized um, communities. So it would then be um, rep represented in the black press. It wouldn't be in the mainstream news necessarily. Um, that, that kind of intimidation that you were talking about is made mainstream by social media. And now people have access to it. So the perception is, is that there's more rather than that this was ongoing, faced certain kinds of communities, um, and then kind of was now aired out um, to um, the entire world in this way. So I think that for me, it's it's sort of figuring out, well, what kinds of civility was possible in the past where people from different racial uh, groups, gender, sexuality, class, were, regions, um, were not included. And how are those norms of civility going to change when those um, people are finally included, you know, brought together in terms of the commitment, cheek and jowl, you know, of, of being next to each other. And we can see this in the kind of experiment of the university itself, which we know is, is changing at, um, in the sense that uh, corporatization, there's no time for curiosity, no time for humor in the way that that exploration, find your major, you know, think about what you may wanna do, make your major apply, not um, make your career apply to your major. Um, and all these kinds of um, infrastructural questions about student debt and about um, uh, time and money and, and, and loss. So I guess, you know, and for me, it's it's more of a question of like through time, like when we've had civility and when we want to return to that particular time, who was not at, who was not included? Thank you. Maybe Kate and Kwame, do you want to come in uh, in some ways to, um, yeah. Um, well, I love universities, but I remember the university in the old days, the American university. I love the ideals of the university. My favorite myth of all time is Plato's cave where we work ourselves out of the cave. But I have seen microaggressions against my African-American students and other students of color. I love comedy, but I also have heard a little too much misogynistic humor from boys and men that is neither civil nor showing much comedic talent, but simply mouthing off. So what I would like, and I also would warn us all against painting the American university, 10,000 institutions, if you include the community colleges, with too broad a stroke, that I think we have to look at certain, certain kinds of colleges, see which ones are working well and which ones are not. But where I would agree with Jonathan is the algorithms of social media do privilege anger. And what I was trying to say is how can we use civility and a set of norms that I call the new decorum or the new civility, how can we use that to reduce the infliction of suffering? And where I would strongly agree with Lynn is that we, the past of our precious institutions, the past was not always a green and pleasant land. And I think it's incumbent on us all to see who was excluded, how they were treated when they were included, 
and the sheer hard work it took to open up not just the social life of the university, but to open up the intellectual life of the university. I have a little handbook of jokes about women and gender studies. I don't look at it anymore, but it's there. And they weren't very funny either. Uh, Anthony. Sorry, yes, sorry. I have to cut that mute. Um, uh, we've been doing this for two years and you still forget to unmute, at least I do. Um, it seems to me that um, if your notion of civility is the, uh, the notion of how it's appropriate for people who are fellow citizens to treat one another, whether what they're fellow citizens of is the university or the country or, or, the, or the corporation, um, then of course it's a problem uh, if the institution is meant to be, um, uh, for example, not racist, uh, if the actual practices uh, and the ways in which people treat one another um, are uh, oppress, uh, oppress black people um, and so on. I mean, mutatis mutandis for, the, for the, all the cases. So whatever our disagreements about the analysis of the past, it seems to me there's a sort of clearish forward-looking thought, which is that we want to develop ways of behaving in each of these institutions that combine making it possible for the institution to do what it's supposed to do. And in the case of the university, that's um, teaching and research aimed at uh, trying to get to deeper understanding of the world um, with uh, proper treatment of everybody who's, who's here, which should be a representative sample of everybody in a decent democratic university. Um, so, Part of what we're facing at the moment, I think, is, is the tension between those two reasonable aims, uh, which is that uh, some of the ways in which we've habitually done things are um, persist in, in being either felt as or certainly, uh, and sometimes just are exclusionary. And we have to figure out how to uh, deal with that while not losing track of the fact that the function of the institution is isn't to make people feel good it's to find out the truth uh, or to deepen our understanding I would say so and those things can come into tension with one another look I, I am someone who um, the reason I know Skip Gates um, is that uh, there were only two brown fellas in my college at Cambridge and he was the other one <laughs> when I was an undergraduate. I know what it's like to be in an institution that assumes that everybody will be white. Um, and the college we both went to had admitted women for the first time the year that I went there. And boy, was it having a hard time figuring out how to be a Cambridge college that wasn't just for, for men and boys. So we've had to make these, we, we're making the right transitions, right? We're, we're, it's not a single sex institution anymore and it's not all white, but that's, bound to create problems, you know, exactly for the reason Lynn said, that um, the old ways of doing things were designed around who was there and, and making them comfortable. And um, so I, I think that it's not surprising that there are tensions here. Um, what, I, what I think is needed is, is uh, you know, the, the sort of um, um, goodwill, really, that Kate was assuming, right, the willingness uh, I mean, I, I think I do find myself uh, from time to time thinking, um, I can't say that um, because I know that the interpretation will be uncharitable or that there's a serious risk of that. That's not good for the life of the university. I'm not talking about making jokes. I'm talking about making contributions to the, to the life of a seminar. I'm not talking about, you know, random stuff. Um, and I don't, I don't like feeling like that. Um, and it doesn't happen to be very often. I'm not, and, I, and I'm not complaining because my life is great. And if I did say those things, I wouldn't be fired. But, um, but I, I, I would like a little bit more um, charity, even on the part of those who feel uh, rightly that the university hasn't been um, open to them in the way that it should have been. 
and that it still hasn't figured out to be open, how to be open to them yet. I still, even those people, because after all, and again here, Kate's point about the, general, the, the vastness of the range of institutions is important, but in the sort of institution that we're at, um, it's an enormous, uh, you're very lucky to be here. I'm very lucky to teach here. My students are very lucky to be here. Most people, many, many people in the world don't have anything like these opportunities. And many, many people in this country don't have these anything like these opportunities. Yeah. And I think a bit of good goodwill uh, is part of civility, a bit of trying to, as it were, look on the bright side of other people, even when they're doing bad things and even when they're living by bad habits. Hey, go ahead. If we ask, where is there a lack of civility, a lack of good citizenship, a lack of citizen, not only good citizenship, but a lack of the new decor, decorum as I defined it. Where are we actually seeing it? On the internet, I agree. But if I am, of the many concerns I have for my democracy, it is the banning of books that is now going on. This is not good citizenship. This is not creating an educated population. It helps no one to ban Art Spiegelman's mouse or Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. It helps no one create. It helps no one intellectually. It helps no one emotionally. Maybe emotionally it helps people. Ha ha, I banned a book today. It does not help the creation of a civil citizenry which has all the virtues that I think one thing we've shared today in this panel under your leadership, Uli, we've all been looking for a way out. We've all been looking for a way to reconstitute the presence, call it civility, Call it the new decorum. We all want things to be different. Some of us agree more than others about how much we mourn the past, how much we see the infliction of sufferings. But we are looking for a brighter horizon. Um, I have the somewhat sobering role of uh, closing this <laughs> convening now, so I want to thank <laughs> participants again, and I want to thank the Bradama Center, but especially Professors Apia, Iragaki, uh, Hyde, and Stimson. Thank you for being part of this. I think we can say there's a couple of things we've raised that we have not resolved, and that is probably the intention of such a, a meeting. And we hope to continue this conversation. As Lynn Brown pointed out, there are several, um, um, several iterations of this conversation. and. Uh, Maybe some of you will be lucky enough to be brought back as panelists. I think some questions we raised about power, accountability, who gets to decide, and the diagnosis of the present and the, the way out of this are all topics to be explored in the future. So I want to thank again the people who participated. I also want to thank our attendees um, to tune in today. And uh, the Bradema Center will make this available, I presume, uh, for you later. Consum consumption and enjoyment. And what Jonathan said earlier, I do think um, what's also, and I think Kate also said, what's also very much needed and present in the university, there's pleasure and joy and humor. And I actually think I teach constantly books that are considered difficult and controversial and I have enormous pleasure. And I think my students have enormous pleasure in that as well. Um, so again, I wanna thank your intellectual commitment to this cause and the Bradema Center for convening us. Thank you. <laughs>